people work to some degree so they don't starve. Now that's a very negative way of looking at it, but much work, if not all, is also routine and socialization and commitment and meaning. I talked with a psychologist yesterday from North Dakota State who wrote, he studies meaning from an existential perspective, and he wrote an article in Newsweek criticizing the idea of universal basic income. Mm -hmm. And the reason he criticized it was because, well, he noted, for example, that one of the things that drives people to suicide is the idea that they're a functionless burden. And so imagine that you identify a segment of the population and you essentially say to them, we can't think of anything useful for you to do, but it would be annoying to watch you starve, so here's some money. I mean, I'm being very cynical about that, but it's, it isn't obvious, especially that conscientious people would respond to that with anything but despair. And so obviously we need to take care of dispossessed people, but but that's a complicated problem and merely giving people money is not a sufficiently sophisticated solution. And that does go to the dignity of work, right? The need, we're like pack animals. We need to pull now some people more than others. It's, it's really tightly associated with trait conscientiousness, one of the big five personality traits. But conscientious people who have nothing to do, they're de they despair. It's, it's, not, it's not in their nature to to not and, work. And I think that's absolutely right. I mean, when we, I mean, we have constantly asked about veteran suicide and, and what mm -hmm. I say is the, the, you know, why aren't we talking about active duty military suicide? Why, why is it when you become a veteran, you're somehow more prone to suicide? Now there's some in, in PTSD. This is very interesting. My intuition is that it's a loss of purpose and mission. Well, and you know, one of the things I studied military people for a long time with the U.S. Naval Academy. Uh, that's a whole story in and of itself, I'll tell you. But we were looking at what predicts military success among uh, among their, their students. We could predict it quite well. And the most salient predictor, apart from general cognitive ability, which predicts virtually anything complex, and that's IQ essentially, was trait conscientiousness. And the thing yeah. about conscientious people is that they live for duty. They are, they are like sled dogs, man. If, if they don't have a purpose, they'll become desperate. And it's like the upside to conscientiousness is it makes you more successful because you're a harder worker, let's say. You put in more hours. But the downside is if you lose your job, for example, you're made su superfluous for one reason or another, you'll eat yourself up with despair. Radical leftists, they, they react to me this way. They say, well, you hold a position of privilege and power. And I think, first, you don't know a goddamn thing about me and you have no idea how I got to my position of privilege and power. And it was no birthright, I can tell you that. I was a small, like, thick glassed, intellectual, non, what do you call that? Athletic child. You know, I was a year younger than my peers. I suffered plenty of, what would you say? trouble for my loud mouth and my intellect when I was growing up, you know? I had my struggles. I'm not complaining about it. The point is, is that you can't attribute privilege to a class of people, you know? And you can't attribute power to people who happen to occupy a position of competence and authority either. There's some possibility that they occupy that because they worked hard and were fortunate, let's not forget about that, and had some good social support and didn't have some horrible disease, thank God. But you can't just make the case that the position is there as a reward it's not there as, as a reward at all it's there as a consequence of the person offering something valuable to those who want to pay for it and the reason you pay for them isn't to reward them it isn't so that you give them a pat on the back and say well you're a good person and you know you deserve this position it's because you're saying to them produce we find what you're producing of value and so we're going to give you what you need in order to be motivated to keep doing it but it's not because we like you it's not because we, re we respect your rights. It has nothing to do with equity. It's we're trying to get every goddamn thing we can from you as fast as possible. And we're going to pay you to do it. And so people deserve their damn pay. And the reason they deserve it isn't because it's a reward. It's because that's how you get productive people to do things that are difficult and time consuming and that perhaps they wouldn't do on their own accord to continue doing them so you can benefit from it. So the whole notion that 
you know, we're awarding positions of privilege to oppressive patriarchal types. It's like, we just have to get rid of that. Enough of that. That's, that's nonsense. Citizens have the inalienable right to benefit from the results of their own honest labor. That's a good one. Yes, that's a conservative truism. You know, why? Well, it isn't because you, because you're good-hearted and you want them to have money. It's because they'll work if you let them benefit from the work and you want them to work because if they work, then they do things that you need. It's as simple as that. It's self-interest and it's the right kind of self-interest. So if you work hard, it's like, great, have your money. You know, and you, you hear people all the time talking about how corrupt our society is and how the 1%, you know, occupies this pinnacle position. You know, the 1% turns over pretty damn fast, just so you know it. So you have about a 10% chance of spending at least one year in the top 1% chance during your life. I think that's right. I think it's 10%. It might be higher than that. But it's fast. It, it's, the 1% is stable as a phenomena, but it turns over very rapidly in terms of who occupies it. And it's the same in every society. The wealth is always distributed inequitably. It's a natural law. You can look it up. It, it, it was discovered by a guy named Wilfred Pareto back in the late 1800s. Goods tend to, dem to distribute themselves inequitably. It can be a problem, but it doesn't mean that there's something fundamentally corrupt about the social structure that's driving it in that direction. And Like, you, you don't want some filthy rich geniuses lying around? Like, maybe you do. I mean, look at what Elon Musk is doing, for God's sake. Maybe he should have ten times as much money as he has. He's going to launch a rocket every five days to Mars in the next ten years, right? He wants to wipe out fossil fuel cars, and he might do it. He wants to revolutionize the transportation system, and he might do it. He wants to put us on the damn solar grid with his new batteries, and he might do it. It's like, oh no, he has a couple of billion dollars. Well, God only knows what he's going to produce with that. It's like, so... Obviously, there's going to be some corrupt, there's going to be some corrupt, rich plutocrats who do nothing but smoke cigars and snort cocaine. They're not going to live very long anyways. But there's lots of people out there who have the money they have because they would really like to do interesting and creative things with it. Not because they're interested in gathering more, you know, paper money to stuff in their mattress and, and to, like, to feel the, the smooth the smooth delight of gold coins between their fingers before they go to bed. Like, what kind of attitude is that towards people who've made their fortune? You know, you think that about Steve Jobs? You think that about Bill Gates? I mean, good God, I don't know how... Those people made a lot of money, but man, thank God they were around, you know? They've given us some tools that are just absolutely unbelievable. So, you know, maybe we could leave the jealousy of the successful behind for a while and notice now and then that some of the people who got to where they are actually deserve to get to where they are and we should be thankful that they exist. That would be nice. A little gratitude. There's good literature showing that conscientious people who lose their jobs are much more likely to become depressed. Mm. Yeah, because they, like they're, you know, th these are these are fundamental sub-personalities. That's part of the way that you might look at it. So you're made of, you're, you have a position in each of these traits and that gives you a personality. If you're really, really high in openness, let's say, if you don't create, you die. Like that's your life. If you're high in extroversion, if you're not with people, you, 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 you dry up and blow away. So th these, are, these are deeply rooted inside of you and conscientiousness is a trait like that. And so people, who, especially conscientious people, they need purpose. It's not optional. It's 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 the it can be their defining characteristic. So and that's would, definitely would, yeah. true for military people. I mean, the military is built for conscientious people. That, it has that, to be. Yeah. Well, it's you see one of the things the navy the the naval academy wanted us to do was to uh, see if we could select for creativity as well, right? Because they wanted independent thinkers and so forth. And it's really tough because most of the military regimen is is suited primarily to to. Uh, conscientious people now if you're open and creative that might work really well if you're in an advanced leadership role but the question is how the hell do you get there because if you're not highly conscientious you're going to get in trouble as you rise through the ranks and lots of companies have this problem by the way because at the low end conscientiousness is vital and openness might be merely disruptive you can think about this I think it's worth thinking about because I think this is how we think of each other and I think this is how we treat each other and I think this is what we upbraid ourselves for when we fail.
You wake up in the morning. And what is it that confronts you? Now, you could say that it's the material reality of the circumstances around you and that you're driven like clockwork by that. But that isn't how it appears phenomenologically, I don't believe. I, I don't see, see that that's how we see ourselves when we awaken in the morning. What we see in front of us is a, a field of potential, constrained to a large degree for some of us and wider for others, but still definitely present. And that's the domain of what could be that day. And I think the day is the right level of analysis. And you wake up and you confront the world and you think, well, here's a variety of ways that things could play themselves out today. And that's that field of potential that's in front of you. It could go this way or it could go this way or it could go that way. And you know that maybe you have difficult decisions ahead of you. And you know that perhaps you're motivated to avoid some of them or maybe not to take the difficult decision but to take the easy way out and you have some inkling of how things would go if you did it properly or if you avoided it or if you took the easy way out you can you can understand how the future would be likely to unfold if you took any of those patterns of action and then you get up and you decide to act or to not act in accordance with your decisions and as a consequence you turn the potential that characterizes the future into the actuality of the present and the past. And so to me what that means is that whatever your consciousness is, which in the oldest sense is the thing that has, what would you say, it's, the, it's that which dwells within you that's made in the image of the God who created things at the beginning of time, that's the idea, is that the implementation of that transforms the chaotic potential that confronts you in the form of the indeterminate future into the actual world. And that's what we do. And we do that as a consequence of our moral choices. And in Genesis, it's, the claim is that insofar as God used the Logos to perform exactly the same function, then the habitable order that was created was good. And that's insisted upon repeatedly. And so there's a deep ethic there. And it, it's a very deep ethical idea. And the idea is that you have, it's possible, you have within your grasp the possibility to take the world despite its suffering and its malevolence and to confront it in a manner that, as a consequence of applying truth, will transform what you produce out of that potential into what is good. And that's a call for a particular form of ethical being. And it's on you, is that you make decisions to go this way or that way and some of the decisions lead up to something that's positive and some of the decisions lead down to something that's negative and if enough of us make the decision to move down into what's negative then that's exactly what happens and we create situations around us that are so close to hell that the distinction is merely semantic. And so you might say, well, you're no believer in heaven and perhaps you're no believer in God, but you could easily be a believer in the ability of your own cowardly indecision and determination to use deceit instead of confronting things courageously and truthfully to produce something around you that's hell for all intents and purposes. And I think that that was the lesson of the 20th century. I think that's exactly what happened. I think that the reason it happened is because individuals abandoned their moral responsibility. And that moral responsibility is, in some, in some sense, absolute enough to be unbearable. Having said that, so, so then my conclusion, because of all that, and for other reasons as well, was that, well, it was true that life is suffering tainted by malevolence, but that there was a power of spirit that characterized the human being that enabled him or her to confront that forthrightly with nobility of purpose and to transcend the suffering and constrain the malevolence and that that was within our grasp. And that what that meant fundamentally was that despite the undeniable 
structural reality of finitude and evil that the spirit of the human being was so powerful in its potential that that could be confronted and accepted as a fundamental responsibility and then transcended and repaired as a consequence. And so that was an inversion of the most pessimistic possible view, I suppose, which is that life is ineradicably suffering and malevolence, into the opposite view, which is that if that is taken on voluntarily, then it's something that can be transcended and rectified. And that that's the sacred responsibility of every single person. And worse, that the abdication of that responsibility, which is in some sense virtually unbearable in its weight, that the abandonment of that or the avoidance of it produces a void in the structure of reality that's filled by something that's hellish. And so it's not only that you fail to make things better when you could by stopping doing the things that you know to be wrong, but that if you don't take forthright action, then the space you leave is filled by something that's dreadful. And so the conclusion of all that was that the collectivists were wrong. And those who insisted that the individual was the sovereign foundation of the state and that each individual has a divine element that's the rationale for that foundational sovereignty and the reason for our equality before God and the law, that that's correct in the most fundamental of ways. And so what I've been attempting to do since then, and I guess that's part of the reason why you're all here, I suppose, is to suggest to individuals that there's far more to you than you would like to believe. And that whether you manifest that in the world properly makes far more difference than you would like to imagine. And the downside of that is the crushing weight of that voluntary adoption of your moral burden. But the upside is the discovery of the nobility that's within you, that's of sufficient force and power to be aligned in some sense with the most fundamental realities of, of the world and that constitutes a sufficient wellspring of strength if drawn upon properly for you to bear the suffering and malevolence that characterizes the world without becoming corrupted as a consequence. Thank you very much. What do you think of the skills that people should start to develop in their 20s in general to make them better human beings, more potentially uh, open to success financially, relationship, health-wise? What are two or three things that everyone should focus on in their 20s? Well, it certainly doesn't hurt to be in physical, good physical condition so we can walk through it. Stop drinking too much. How do you know if you're drinking too much? Um, you regret what you do when you're drinking. It's, it's interfering with other important goals. It's, it's causing you financial distress. It's getting you in trouble with your friends or your family. It's getting you in trouble with the police. Okay, so stop abusing substances if you can, right? If you see that they're um, hurting you. Um, and alcohol is particularly pernicious in that regard. So, physical health, are you in decent shape? Are you strong and coordinated? And if you're not, well, you'd be better if you were. <laughs> you'd feel better, you'd be more effective, you'd live longer, you'd be less sick. 
and you really see that mount up. Like if someone's been in shape once in their life, they age way better. And it's also a really good way of maintaining your cognitive ability. Like, you know, you, you hear about those exercises that you can do online to make you smarter and keep your cognitive ability intact. Yep. Those don't work. There's no evidence that they work. People keep saying that they make you smarter. Or they maintain your cognitive function. Psychologists have studied that for 50 years, hoping that one of those things will work. Trying all sorts of creative tacks, they don't work. Exercise works. Cardiovascular and weightlifting, you start to decline in your fluid intelligence at about the age of 25. And it's a linear trend downhill and it can accelerate as you get older. It's just like this, quite ugly. If you exercise, you stave that off. So that's really useful. Um, maintain your relationships and and foster them they're un so when i look at successful people they're really good at something they're reliable right you can count on their word they're generous and they have a wide wide connection network which becomes more and more valuable as you get older yeah so it's one advantage that older people really have over younger people they have a connection network and a connection network is huge well, you could be connected to a thousand well-connected people. Okay, that means you are connected to the entire world. <laughs> right, it's unbelievably valuable. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that's so absolutely remarkable about the situation that I'm in right now as far as one of the great benefits is yeah, I, can access. Co yeah. I can contact pretty much anybody and they'll talk to me. It's yeah. like, really? Right. That's so right. cool. I'm 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 interested in infrastructure for reasons I won't get into, but I'm interested in infrastructure development. I think it's a good method of wealth transfer. It's a good solution to the problem of inequality and, and employment. Um, I reached out to a leading expert, a leading expert on infrastructure last week, to see if he'd talk to me. I thought I don't know anything about infrastructure except that it's worn to a frazzle and we should do something about it. You know, he agreed to talk. And you, having a connection network is of an inestimable, inestimable value. It's huge. Um, reliability, generosity, you can work on both of those. Philosophical sophistication, it's very useful um, because it orients you properly. You have a, a sophisticated sense of, of the world. You find, for example, that um, doing things for other people is actually more rewarding than virtually anything else you can do. You know, when you hear you should be of service to other people. Well, if you actually watch yourself, you pay attention to yourself and you do something that helps someone else and it genuinely helps them. I defy you to find another experience that is that satisfying. It's actually quite stunning how satisfying that is. And so that's a very useful thing to realize. Why is that such a satisfying thing for human beings? Uh, there's no better strategy for, there's no better life strategy. I mean, imagine, I could give you a, a quick sort of technical example. So imagine I take two people and I say, okay, um, I'm going to give you $100 and you have to give some of it to the person right beside you. And they can either agree or disagree with the split, but if they disagree, you don't get anything. Okay, so a classical economist would say that the person should take the 100, offer the person next to them a dollar, and the person should accept it because why not? They get a dollar instead of nothing. And that's the solution. But what happens is that if you don't offer that other person something close to 50-50, they're it's likely to tell you. you to go to hell. Yes, yeah. very. And then, and and then you, you think, get well, nothing. You get nothing too. You think, well, why would people do that? Because they just reject $50 and who cares? And the answer is, well, we don't just play one game with other people. We play a repeating game. And so, so imagine we did this. So imagine it's a crowd and they're all watching you. And... I offer you $100 and you have to share it with the person next to you. And you say, would you like to take $70? And 
And the person says, well, I'm not sure that's fair to you, but if it's okay, yes. But then everyone else sees that. And now they all have an opportunity to pick who they're going to play with next. Well, you're not going to get picked, picked last, are you? Remember what you told me? You didn't want to get picked last, right? I did not. Okay, so what you did was you turned yourself into an athlete. A machine. Okay. That was always going to be a first. Okay, great. So, but imagine we expand that game. Yes. And we say, you want to be the person that everyone wants to play with. Yep. Well, then all you have in your whole life is invitations to play. Well, how, how, and how are you going to be that person? Be productive, straightforward, generous. Make everyone else better around you and they're going to want to play with you. Absolutely. So there you go. And then you get to play. Yeah, exactly. Well, how is that not the best possible deal? It's yeah. clearly, see, so, so the reason, if, if the ethical argument is put properly, it is by far the most compelling argument. It's like, if you want to have everything you could possibly want and more, then be a good person. The better a person you are, the more likely that is to happen. That doesn't mean you that you're completely protected against getting cut off at the knees. But there's no better strategy. That's it. And you can even think about it selfishly. And I talk about this to some degree in Beyond Order. Let's say you let's say that I you want to be selfish. You think that's the best possible strategy. Mm -hmm. Why should I care about others? Okay, let's say you should only act in your own best interest. Well, then it's like, well, what's your best interest? Well, what does interest mean and what does you mean? What's in your best interest? Your best interest, three mysteries. What's your, what's best, what's interest? Okay, well, there's you, but you aren't just you right now. You're you and you tomorrow, and you next week, and you next month, and you in five years, and you in 10 years, and you when you're a pensioner. You're a community of selves mm. stretched across time. And so if you were enlightened and selfish, you would act in a manner that would benefit that entire community across time. And I don't think that's any different than acting on the best possible part for other people. I, I think they're the same problem. So I think as soon as human beings discovered the future, we we know we were no longer singular individuals. We're instantly each a community, and then the community ethic prevails. And the community ethic is: I want to win in a way that makes you win. That's the best possible victory. Jocko was telling me when we talked this week, he's this tough character, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and he could have, and I'm not telling tales out of school here. He could have been a criminal, no problem. <laughs> and he knows that perfectly yeah. well. And I'm not, saying, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying, I'm not saying that as a slur on his character, partly because I believe the Nietzschean dictum that a lot of morality is just cowardice. Whatever he might be, he's not a coward. Right. And so, and just because you obey the laws doesn't mean you're moral. It just might mean you're afraid. In any case, so the question is, well, what socialized this brute? Well, he was taught in the Navy SEALs. Yeah. Take care of your team. That's your fundamental purpose. Mm -hmm. And he noted, and we had a long discussion about this. The successful guys, man, they've, you know, they've got your back, wow. right? They, you know, Trust that above them, yeah. all. Yeah. And if, and if, if, if you aspire to a leadership position among those brutes, let's say, and you aren't someone they know to have your back, they're not following. You're not going to make it. Yeah. Uh -uh. You're not going to make it. And so that's, this is why the discussions of power that are so prevalent in, in modern culture bother me so much. It's like, you think male hierarchies are predicated on power? You really think that? They are when they've gone rotten. But when they're not rotten, that's not what they're predicated on at all. 
the capacity to exercise power, that's really important. You need that. It has to be part of you for you to be admirable. It's like you could be a badass son of a bitch. Yes, I see that. And, and that way I'm somewhat intimidated by you. And that's actually a testament to your moral virtue that you have enough force and power to be intimidating. But then if you can encapsulate that and take that potential for power and harness it to this broader good, well, that's unstoppable. I'm 40, but I feel like a child watching everyone around me get older and die. So I'm homesick for the past instead of accepting the terrifying present. How can I stop mourning the past? Now you're suffering from what Freud described as uh, reminiscences of the past. You're possessed by reminiscences. They won't get out of your mind. And what that means to me is, well, it's one of two things. One is that there's things in your past that you need to understand more deeply. And that's why they're still calling to you. And there are things in your past that you had, perhaps, that you need to have in the present and the future. And so you could do the past authoring program and write out your past. It, it asks you to detail the most emotionally significant events that occurred during different epochs or stages of your life. So you have to break your life into a number of stages. I think we recommended six, but you can break it into as many as you want or as few and then to deal out, detail out the significant positive and negative occurrences you know, that stand out in your memory from those times. And that'll kind of help put the past to rest, but it also might highlight for you what it is that you're nostalgic for. And then that can help you figure out what to aim for in the future. And so, you know, it sounds like you're rather hopeless about the present and by implication the future. And, and maybe that's because you don't have a richly enough developed conception of what it could be. So you could go back to your past and find out what it is that you wanted and had, and then you need to make a plan for how you might obtain that in the future. Um, now, it, it's a bit more complicated than that because you talked about death, you know, and, and so you may be longing in some sense for a return to in a state of blissful ignorance where you weren't concerned about mortality. And, you know, the only real medic medication for that, I think that's real, is to live as worthwhile a life as you can, as full a life, so you don't have regrets. I'm not sure that so much that people are afraid of death, they're, they're maybe afraid of not living enough. And maybe if you lived enough, you could let it go when it was time. I, I think there's some truth in that. And so if you're overly afraid of death, it may be because you have a lot of unlived life in you and you can go back to the past and you can find out what you needed and perhaps had then and then you can strive to attain that in the present and the future. And those exercises could, at least in principle, help you with that. So what are you missing, right? What are you missing that the past had for you? And maybe you write that down. Like, well, I had this. It was really important to me and I you know, had a loving relationship with someone and I don't have that now. I I had the security of a comfortable home life and I don't have that now. It's, well, those are things that now become ambitions, right? Because a lack is, an ambition and a lack are mirror images of one another. So if you can identify what you lack, you can derive an ambition from that. And you might say, well, that's impossible. It's like, well, you decompose it into small steps. And that's complicated, but so life is complicated. So there's no way around that. You're somewhere, because you have to be somewhere. Now you might not know where that is, which means that the somewhere that you are is chaotic, in which case you need to go over your past in great detail and figure out where you are. It's like you're lost, right? You're, you're lost and the problem with being lost is when you're lost, you don't know where to go. And the problem with not knowing where to go is there's a million places that you could go and a million places is too many places for you to go without dying. So being lost is not good. So you need to know where you are. One of the things that we built online, my partners and I, is this program called Past Authoring that helps people lay out the, the, the narrative of their past to identify to break their life down into six stages, epochs, we call them, and then to identify the 
emotionally significant moments in each epoch and to write them out, what happened negatively, what happened positively, what the consequences were, what you derived from it, perhaps what you could have done differently, perhaps what you learned from it, all of that, so that you can narrow in, zero in on determining precisely where it is that you are right now. And people are often loath to do that because they actually don't want to know, because they'd rather be spread out in a sort of half-blind manner in the fog, hoping that the place that they're at is better than it really is, and deluding themselves by remaining vague than to figure out, I'm right here right now with these specific problems. But it's actually better to, to do that, because if you have a set of specific problems and you've really narrowed them down and really specified them, then you can probably start fixing them. And you can start fixing them in mic micro ways, bit by bit. But there's no way you can do that without knowing where you are. It's impossible. And you can kind of tell if you don't know where you are. It's quite straightforward. If you are haunted by reveries of the past for events that are older than approximately 18 months, if they continue to come up in your mind over and over, in your dreams over and over, you haven't extracted the world out from your past experiences. The potential is still trapped in the past. And to confront the potential means to confront the dragon of the past. And of course, that's terrifying, and it can seriously be terrifying. So for example, maybe you're vague and ill-formed and ill-defined because you were abused very badly when you were a child, four years old, something like that. And maybe you were abused by a family member, because that's generally who does the abusing. And so that just makes it worse. And then what that means is that you've got a implicit, you've had an implicit encounter with malevolent evil that, no, you've had a direct encounter with malevolent evil, but you have an implicit hypothesis of malevolent evil that's plaguing you. It's still there, it's trapped in the memories, right? It's, it's trapped in the representational structure, and as an adult, you're now faced with the necessity of articulating that fully before you have any chance whatsoever of freeing yourself from it. And so that's no joke. Lots of times people have to go into the past, that's what the psychoanalysts do, and, th and say, look, here, something came along just bloody well knocked me over and it isn't even that I repressed it which which I think was well we won't talk about Freud's errors because Freud was a genius so we'll just leave him alone but but sometimes it's not repression it's just that terrible things happen to people at such a young age that there isn't a bloody chance in hell that they can figure out why they happened or what to do with them or what they mean and then you can carry that with you and you carry it with you it's like you're you're your body encounters the world in stages, and it happens very rapidly. Well, it can extend over years, but the initial stages happen very rapidly. So, for example, if you're walking down the road and you hear a large noise, be a loud noise behind you, you'll go like this. That's a predator defense response, by the way. You crouch down, and that's to stop something from jumping on your back and getting at your neck too easily. That's like a few, mil a few hundred milliseconds. It's really fast, or even faster than that, and it better be because something like a snake, let, we'll say, can nail you just right now, so you better be fast. But it's low resolution, it's like danger snake, something like that, or danger predatory cat, it's that fast. And then you can unravel that and categorize it, but that takes time. You do that with emotion, and then you do it with cognition, and you can do that with long-term thinking, you know, because maybe you've encountered someone specifically malevolent and predatory at work. That happens to people a lot, who's operating as a as a destructive bully and who seems to have no positive function whatsoever and is only living that out and then you you know you don't know what to do about it so you're you're in prey mode I don't mean this kind of mode although that would help too but I mean you're acting like a prey animal and then you have this terribly complex thing to decompose which is what the hell's up with this person why are they making my life miserable what is it about me that allows them to make my life miserable? That's a nasty little road to walk down. And you're stuck with having to, you're stuck with having to decompose it. Maybe you can't. Maybe formulating an explicit philosophy of good and evil to deal with something malevolent in your environment actually just happens to be beyond you. And that could easily be. It's certainly the case for people who are young. And it's the case for plenty of adults as well. It's no simple thing to, ma to manage. It's something, too, that often soldiers who have post-traumatic stress disorder have to do because they've encountered terrible things. They've either done them or ran into them. And they need to update their moral model of the world or if they end up in something close enough, closely approximating hell.
need to know where you are. That's this, what is, where are you? So you're navigating, you're a navigator, you're a sailor on an ocean, man, that's what, that's what you are. You're a mobile creature, you're going from point A to point B all the time. You're not sitting there glued to a rock like some brainless, you know, sea creature. There's a funny little creature called a hydra, very simple little creature. In its juvenile stage, it has a brain because it swims around, but then when it turns into an adult, it latches itself to a rock and promptly digests its brain. Because if you're just sitting on a rock and you're not moving, you don't need a brain. So, but that's not our issue, right? We're, we're zipping around in the world, and so we're navigating agents. And so to navigate, you, there's two things you need to know. And the first is, where the hell are you? Exactly, precisely, right? Razor sharp. What's good about you and what's bad about you? By your own, by your own reckoning. You don't have to... You can ask other people, but this is a game you play yourself. It's like, as far as I'm concerned, I'm taking stock. What is it that's okay about me and what needs some work? And you've got to watch to not be too self-critical when you're doing that too, because that can just be another kind of flaw. Well, so what happens with, with Abraham? Well, he's at home, and these angels show up. Now... We don't know whether they're angels or men precisely because, well, as this part of the story reads, as the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. So he's another visionary state by, the, by all appearances. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. There's real ambivalence in the story about the men. Are there three men? Are there three angels? Are there two angels in God? It's all mixed up in the story, so we won't clarify that. We'll leave it ambiguous. And I think the ambiguity is important because you don't know who the stranger is when you encounter him. And it depends on whether you're thinking about it in the normative manner or if you're thinking about it in the transcendent manner. Because with each person that you meet, well, they're just a person. That's one way of thinking about it. And, and then they're the person that you know or they're the person as they choose to reveal themselves to you and people keep themselves shielded but then they're also something of great metaphysical potential right and you might say well do you believe that and i would say well yes you believe it because you expect a lot from people generally speaking and are not happy if they betray you but more importantly our entire culture is predicated on the idea that each person has an indefinite intrinsic worth and i'm not talking about self-esteem i'm talking about something like the what 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 would you say it the implicit presupposition in our legal structure that no matter who you are even if you're a murderer even if you're a condemned murderer that there's something about you that's of transcendent value that has to be respected by the law by the law and by other people right and so that's that's a remark and you might say well you know do i believe that and the answer to that is well you act it out because you follow the law and it's not an easy thing to pull out of the law. It's kind of the idea that you have intrinsic natural rights. And you don't pull that out of our law, man, without having the whole thing fall down. And I think the whole idea that you have intrinsic natural rights is predicated on something like the biblical hypothesis that human beings have a logos nature and that we are involved in the speaking forth of being. And as beings who, who are involved in the speaking forth of being, there's something about us that has to be respected by, by ourselves in relationship to ourselves, by ourselves in relationship to other people, but even more strangely, by ourselves in relationship to even to criminals, even to vicious criminals. You can't remove that transcendent element. And that's, that to me, that's also a, mir a miracle of conceptualization because who the hell is going to think that up, right? Even the most vicious of murderers has a touch of the transcendent that needs to be respected. Of all the ideas that are unlikely, that's got to top the list. And of course, without that, you, you have a very barbaric legal system, right? Because no one is protected. As soon as you make a mistake, then you're in the damned and you have no rights whatsoever. And that isn't what happens in the West, which is an absolutely amazing thing. So anyways, Abraham is a master of the stranger. That's one way of thinking about it. He knows what to do when strangers come along and he opens his he opens himself up to them and i would say he does that we know he's not a naive guy abraham right he's no weakling a couple of stories ago he took a big army and you know went and harassed a bunch of kings and took his nephew back he's 
He's a tough guy. And so if strangers show up and he welcomes them, it's not because he couldn't do otherwise. He could certainly do otherwise. And it's not because he isn't aware of what people can be like. He's perfectly aware of what people can be like, but he determines to take a particular attitude towards them, and that is to welcome them. And so, and why would you do that? And I, I think the answer to that is, you hold out your hand in trust to someone and you evoke the best from them if that's there to be given. So it's an act of courage. It's like, it's, it isn't me meeting you, exactly. Not exactly. It's more like the transcendent part of me making a gesture that allows the transcendent part of you to step forward. And that happens all the time. It happens all the time in, in normative discourse. You know this perfectly well because sometimes you can have a real casual conversation with someone that just goes nowhere, right? It's just shallow as can be. Or now and then you can actually make contact with someone, right? And you're both, I would say, enlightened and ennobled by the conversation. And that's a deep, we would call that a deep conversation for, for some reason because we made a deep connection. Whatever that means, it, it means, well, it certainly means that it's not shallow. We're not sure about what these metaphor means, but it means that it reaches deep inside of you. It's something like that. You make direct person-to-person -person contact. And those sorts of conversations are um, replenishing. That, that's the right way to think about it. They, they genuinely are. And I think that's because they provide you with that bread that's not material bread. And that's the information that you need to, to thrive and, and to put yourself together. It does matter how you meet someone, and it does matter how you treat them when you first meet them. And it's amazing. I've learned to do this, at least in part, partly because I'm a clinical psychologist. I've learned how to talk to people very rapidly. And I have the most amazing adventures with people in cabs and when I travel, because I'll talk to them directly right away. And they'll tell me the wildest stories and show me the craziest things, because I'm actually interested in what they have to say. And I'm not afraid. Well, I'm somewhat afraid, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sufficiently afraid to have that stop me. And I'm acting on the presupposition that the person has something of great interest to reveal. And that, that's a very useful thing to know too, because one of the things that's really cool about people, and you really learn this as a clinical psychologist, is that if you can get people talking, they're so damn interesting, you can hardly stand it. You know, because they have these idiosyncratic experiences that are only theirs, right? They're only theirs personally. No one else could tell the story. And that's the kind of stories that you want to hear. And when they tell you those stories, you learn something you didn't know. And so what that means is that you can treat the landscape of strangers as an endless vista of places to learn things you didn't know. And if you know enough so that you're satisfied with your life and everything has ceased to be a tragedy around you, well, then you can be comfortable in your circumscribed domain of of totalitarian knowledge let's say but if you're if your life is insufficient and you're suffering more than you want to and everything isn't what it should be then you need to look where you haven't looked for what you don't have and then you can look outside beyond you and then you can make friends with what you don't understand and that's a huge part of what this story is about because what happens is that Abraham welcomes the men God angels and treats them very well and reaps a tremendous benefit as a consequence and then well then the story reverses and we end up in Sodom and Gomorrah where the same angels sojourn and they're treated terribly and all hell breaks loose and so that's what the story is about it's fundamental now there's a there's a sexual impropriety thing going on that I'm also going to delve into but I don't think that's the critical issue in the story the critical issue in the story is how do you act in the face of the stranger. You know, there's a statement in the New Testament, Christ says something like, when you, when you do something to the least of people, you do it to me, him, right? And that's a very difficult statement to understand too, but it's something like, it, it's something reminiscent of the requirement to keep the idea of the transcendent reality of the person in mind at the same time you keep their proximal reality in mind. To have, to have your mind in two places at the same time when you're talking to people. Um, you know, I learned from a friend of mine in Montreal um, who is very socially sophisticated in, in some ways. Um, whenever, when, whenever he went into a store, I always like going shopping with him. 
And whenever he went into a store and he talked and, and he had an interaction with a clerk, the first thing he would do is have an interaction with the clerk, you know, he, he wouldn't have an interaction with the role of the clerk. He'd like look at the person, sort of take stock of the fact that they were there, and then ask them something genuine about their job or their store or how they were doing, like go into a conversation right away. And he didn't get personal about it, because that can be intrusive, right? You have to be very sophisticated to do this. But he did indicate to the person that he was there, at least in part, for the good that could be done between them. It's something like that. And then the person would be ridiculously helpful. And so then, you know, if people mistreat you, you see this with antisocial kids. It's a very tragic thing to see, because if you're an antisocial child, by the time you're about four, you're very hostile and distrustful to people. And so you're like a growling puppy. And if you're a growling puppy, you tend not to get petted, you're more likely to get kicked. And if you're a growling puppy and you get kicked, then you have even more reason to growl. And that's sort of the story of antisocial kids. If they're not well socialized by the time they're four and they're more on the aggressive side, then they alienate themselves from the community and all they get is rejection. Well, and then they look at the rejection and they think, well, to hell with humanity, you know? And no wonder they think that. But, but the part of the catastrophe is, is that they get what they evoke. And I'm not saying it's their fault precisely, but it doesn't matter. That's still what happens. And so you might ask yourself, if you're not getting from people what you need, there is some possibility that you're not approaching, especially if this happens to you repeatedly across people. And this is a virtual certainty. If it happens to you repeatedly across people, especially if you have the same bad experience with people, it's not them, it's you. I would say three is the limit. If something happens to you once, you write it off. If it happens to you twice, it's like, you open your eyes, but you write it off. But if it happens to you three times, it's probably you. Or it's the rest of the world. Better it's you, because you're not going to change the rest of the world.